On the Waterfront was an unconventional film for its time. It projected a strong sense of social realism that was decidedly absent from the prevalent escapism of 1950s Hollywood. In addition, it heralded a great upheaval that was occurring in the film industry. The collapse of the studio system precipitated by the United States vs. Paramount Supreme Court ruling was a catalyst for this upheaval. The ruling stipulated that studios could no longer block book and blind book to independent cinemas, in addition to compelling the studios to relinquish control of their own cinema chains. This gave way to a less centralized film market which heralded the rise of independent film producers. One of these producers was Sam Spiegel, who gave Ilya Kazan the $1 million budget to direct On the Waterfront. Kazan originally brought the script to Daryl F. Zanuck at 20th Century Fox. Zanuck wanted the film to be shot in color and in cinemascope, but Kazan felt that this aesthetic ran contrary to what he was trying to achieve in making the film. Without an independent producer like Sam Spiegel to take such an innovative risk, On the Waterfront would have likely never been made, at least not in the way Kazan intended to. On the Waterfront served as a vehicle for a new vein of acting known as method acting, which would soon define the next generation of great actors in cinema. Method acting originates almost 40 years earlier from Russian theater director Konstantin Stanislavsky, whose students developed upon the style in conservatories in the United States. Early method actors in the film were John Garfield and Montgomery Clift, who both brought an authenticity to performance that film had never seen before. However, it was Marlon Brando that would be the watershed of method acting on the silver screen. Brando studied at the Actors Studio in New York, one of the several conservatories in the United States that pioneered method acting. Prior to Brando, most acting in cinema was quite mechanical and fit actors based on their own idiosyncrasies. The method approach that Brando used in On the Waterfront when portraying Terry Malloy allowed for a striking and hypnotic performance that truly made one forget that they were watching an actor. In line with method acting, Brando would draw from his own personal experiences, insecurities, and emotions to convey a raw characterization that was true to life, and not seemingly detached from his physicality in attempting to convey such ersatz sentiments. This meant that Marlon Brando had to actually become the character he was playing in his mind. If Terry Malloy was morose, Marlon Brando was morose. If Terry Malloy was angry, Marlon Brando was angry. Basically, Marlon Brando became Terry Malloy. With method acting came a completely different aesthetic. It allowed Brando to embrace his humanity and channel it into his characters. What came with this was a realistic portrayal of Brando's gritty characters. Terry Malloy was rife with humanity, exhibiting the foibles, movements, and countenance of the washed-up ex-prize fighter that he was. You was my brother, Charlie. You should have looked out for me a little bit. You should have taken care of me just a little bit so I wouldn't have to take them dives for the short end money. Well, I had some bets down for you. You saw some money. You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody. Instead of a bum. Which is what I am. Let's face it. Improvisation was integral to this aesthetic. In the conversation scene between Malloy and Edie, Malloy shows his slight anxiety in trying to court Edie. Eva Marie Saint, who plays Edie, accidentally drops her glove in the scene. However, Brando picks it up and fumbles with it awkwardly throughout the dialogue. This element was completely improvised, but Kazan thought it seemed so naturalistic that he used this take in the final cut. The crux of improvisation, as Brando demonstrates in this scene, is for a character to act naturally as one would act when put in certain circumstances. Thus it behooved Brando to pick up the glove and fumble with it nervously, just as a coy suitor like Malloy would do, as opposed to clinically going through the motions of his character by ignoring the dropped glove. These minutiae may seem completely frivolous to the average viewer, but they are what give the character humanity. As a method actor, Brando showcases Terry Malloy's foibles and tics, not because Brando is aware of them, but because they come naturally to him. The director can only project so much of his idea onto a character, but he cannot play the character unless he casts himself. Therefore, improvisation fully allows the actor to exhibit who the character really is and how the character would behave in their situation. This is what makes Terry Malloy a refreshing persona that would herald a new approach to acting for years to come. Ilya Kazan directed On the Waterfront for the screen, but his craft originates from the stage. He previously worked as an actor in a theater troupe with Lee Strasberg, who guided Kazan in developing his acting capabilities. 
Strasberg would later go on to run the Actors Studio, which Kazan co-founded, and where Brando studied. Thus Kazan was pivotal in promulgating method acting into cinema, and On the Waterfront was a vehicle for this newfangled acting style. Kazan's pursuit of authenticity was not just manifested in his direction of actors. The kitschy aesthetic of most other popular films of the 1950s was created in a studio, which allowed for a heavily controlled environment to realize the desired effect. However, as with method acting, this MO was being challenged by the desire to create greater authenticity by shooting on location instead. Location shooting had been done infrequently in prior films to On the Waterfront, mainly in westerns and documentary style film noir. With On the Waterfront, Kazan takes this authenticity to greater effect by shooting a socially conscious drama on location instead of a quirky genre film as done before. This MO is even more effective with the use of method acting. The actors are exhibited in the natural environments of their characters. They are in loading docks, boats, dive bars, city streets, and rooftops. Characters behave authentically and they are placed authentically. Kazan went so far as to cast real longshoremen as extras, in addition to several pugilists. On the Waterfront served as an enduring foray into Hollywood realism through both the employment of method acting and location shooting. While On the Waterfront was not the first attempt at realism in American cinema, it was one of the most influential, and it would come to define the aesthetics of the future generation of new Hollywood directors. On the Waterfront was not just innovative aesthetically, but also with its acerbic social criticism, something that was maverick in the zeitgeist of escapist cinema. The 1950s were not necessarily bereft of any pressing social issues, but it was unorthodox for them to be addressed in such a forthright way that On the Waterfront did. This era saw the apex of trade union membership in the United States, which inevitably led to the growth of trade union power. Many of these unions were connected to organized crime. It was not uncommon for union bosses to embezzle funds from union treasuries for personal luxuries, and use bribery, coercion, and intimidation tactics to manipulate leadership elections so as to maintain their power. On the Waterfront directly tackles trade union corruption without relent. The film opens with Terry Malloy, a washed-up pugilist and longshoreman luring Joey, a fellow longshoreman, into an ambush atop the roof of an apartment block. Joey is then murdered by a couple of henchmen by being thrown from the building. Joey's murderers are soon identified as operatives of Johnny Friendly, the corrupt longshoreman's union boss. It is revealed that Joey was rubbed out because he was going to squeal to the police about union corruption. The direct inspiration for On the Waterfront begins with the murder of New York City longshoreman Tom Collantine in 1948. This story became the impetus for a 24-article expose by investigative journalist Malcolm Johnson, entitled Crime on the Waterfront in the New York Sun. It detailed the corrupt practices of the International Longshoremen's Union in the tri-state area, Johnson would subsequently win the Pulitzer Prize for journalism for the series. His primary source of information was that of Pete Corridan, a papist priest who kept the company of the local longshoremen in dive bars, who gave Father Corridan knowledge of the criminal underworld, which he then relayed to Johnson for his muckraking efforts. Additionally, the character of Terry Malloy was based on real-life longshoreman Anthony DiVincenzo. Like Malloy, DiVincenzo testified before the Waterfront Crime Commission against the mob. Writer Bud Schulberg and director Elia Kazan took interest in adapting Johnson's expose. Schulberg was already established as a subversive writer, having published a novel entitled What Makes Sammy Run about the unscrupulous practices in Hollywood. Thus, Schulberg adapting the story outlined in Crime on the Waterfront was par for the course. While On the Waterfront was not a film made by papists or with a desire to espouse popery, Catholic themes in the film are quite salient. One of the most iconic scenes in the film is the sermon in the cargo boat by Father Barry, which serves as a thematic soapbox for the film. Father Barry admonishes those amongst him that are aware of wrongdoing, but refuse to testify as being just as guilty as the original transgressors. Father Barry likewise admonishes those that would sacrifice their dignity for money, because it's the only way they can get work in the docks. He also admonishes the mobsters for their materialism and how they exploit the working man so cruelly, exemplifying the precepts of Catholic social teaching. Malloy stares vividly at Father Barry as he gives his sermon, knowing himself to be guilty. And anybody who sits around and lets it happen, keeps silent about something he knows has happened, shares the guilt of it just as much as the Roman soldier who pierced the flesh of our Lord to see if he was dead. Yet it is not only Father Barry haranguing him about his guilt. He puts himself in the situation of consoling Edie, Joey's grieving sister, merely because he is attracted to her. 
Yet this situation continues to serve as a reminder of Malloy's guilt. Edie does not know that Malloy was complicit in her brother's death, and she is desperate for answers as to what happened to her brother. Thus, the only way that Malloy can redeem himself is to confess to Edie. Malloy first tells Father Barry about his culpability, and Father Barry insists that Malloy confess to Edie himself. You! Honest to God, Edie. Malloy does confess, much to Edie's dismay, but she eventually forgives him. After Malloy's brother is whacked for protecting him, Malloy plans to exact a violent revenge. However, Father Barry intervenes, shaming Malloy for his bloodlust. He instead implores Malloy to testify against the mob. While Malloy acquiesces to the consequence of ostracism by his friends and companions if he testifies against the mob, he does so at the behest of Father Barry. In all of these actions, we bear witness to the Catholic themes of duty, with Malloy fulfilling his moral obligation to testify, redemption, with Malloy's confession, absolution, with Edie forgiving him, justice in lieu of violence, with Father Barry cajoling Malloy to testify against the mob, and triumph in the face of adversity, with Malloy's ostracism. What do you want? Your gun. Go and chase yourself. Give me the gun. You go to hell. What did you say? Go to hell. Because of a scene in which Malloy tells Father Barry to go to hell, the film would have been subject to censorship by the PCA, the Production Code Administration. But because of the film's strong Catholic sensibilities, it intrigued Joseph Breen, the head of the PCA. Breen himself was a devout papist like many of the founders of the PCA. He successfully argued to the PCA board to make an exception about censoring the line, by positing that this scene is consistent with the Pope's struggle against evil and adversity through the plight of Father Barry. Perhaps the most striking quality about On the Waterfront was actually the allegory it was for Kazan's own personal life. Kazan was a member of the Communist Party in the 1930s, believing them to be an effective vanguard against fascism, but his membership was short-lived. Several other members of the group theater company to which he belonged were also members of the Communist Party. Infighting between Kazan and the party regarding the politics of the group theater ensued, and Kazan acrimoniously relinquished his party membership soon thereafter. An embittered Kazan subsequently developed a strong disdain for communism. In 1952, Kazan was summoned to testify before the House on American Activities Committee regarding the names of the members of the group theater company who were members of the Communist Party, which he divulged. The action lost him many of his friends, including collaborator Arthur Miller, who wrote The Crucible as an allegory for the contemporary witch hunts that Kazan had abetted with his testimony. Two years later, Kazan made On the Waterfront. The parallels between Terry Malloy and Delia Kazan are all too salient, and these are parallels which Kazan himself acknowledged. In the film, Malloy has testified against the mob kingpin, Johnny Friendly. As a result, his friends ostracize him, and he is scorned as a stool pigeon. He feels dismayed at the consequences of his actions, but remains firm in his belief that he was justified. If Kazan was indeed using On the Waterfront to vindicate himself, it serves as an exceptionally powerful argument. However, it should be considered that like Kazan, Malloy was ambivalent about testifying. He wasn't intent on being a hero. He wasn't proactively crusading against evil. Rather, he was just a layman caught in a situation that forced him to choose between good and evil, even if that meant sacrificing his friendships. Malloy's own ambivalence likely echoed Kazan's sentiments, since Kazan initially refused to testify when summoned by the House on American Activities Committee. Nevertheless, Kazan defended his testimony throughout the rest of his life, just as Malloy defends his actions in the end of the film. You ratted on us, Terry! From where you stand, maybe, but I'm standing over here now. I was ratting on myself all them years, I didn't even know it. Come on! You give it to Joey, you give it to Dugan, you give it to Charlie, it was one of your own. You think you're God Almighty, but you know what you are? Come on. You're a cheap, lousy, dirty, stinking mug. And I'm glad what I've done to you. 